that it was always going to be a tough game and uh, yeah, that was one of the toughest games that I've played. I'm Martin Afire and this is my memory lane. And there it is, it's all over. The 1994 Super Cup Challenge Cup winners once again. Wigan for the seventh successive occasion, but they've had to fight for it. 1994 was uh, a challenging year, I think, for the Wigan club. Um, Obviously, John Dorahey uh, was in charge, and you know, things weren't going that great. We uh, lost in the Regal Trophy uh, to Castleford, and uh, you know when you play at Wigan, and you lose uh, one or two games, then uh, it's a crisis. Yeah, the, the cup kept us alive that year. I think we had a, a, a tough road, and in the semi-final, you could see that Castleford they wanted it. Um, they'd obviously been beaten by us in the final in '92. Uh, my first Challenge Cup final and you know they really wanted to beat us and uh, you know everyone was gunning for Wigan at that time. We were at the top but it wasn't easy uh, you know when you look back in history now Wigan have won so many games and everyone just thinks we strolled it but no that was a quality team and it, there was some quality opposition and Casford were up for it. The feeling in the tunnel um, at Wembley, the old Wembley should I say, uh, was everything that you thought it would be. When I stood in that tunnel, you felt it. You felt that you was about to, you know, enter, you know, it was like being a gladiator. You was about to, you know, this is it. You know, you were prepared to die this day. You know, those who were about to die, salute you. It was really that big. And the fact that you're playing for Wigan and the heritage and the history as well, it meant so much. But you were feeling all those passions and emotions, but you had to keep a lid on it. You know, you had to go out there and do a job because if you didn't, then it wouldn't be remembered and then it would be all for nothing. So you'd come that far, you'd got to it, you know, it was the last hurdle, the biggest hurdle, and you, you know, you wanted to do it. And it wasn't about being, you know, just about being there, you know, especially at Wigan, it wasn't about just getting to the final and enjoying it. It was about getting to the final and doing the job. Leeds had Jim Fallon on the wing. He was an England winger. You know, I'd never played for England, so I had that chip on my shoulder as well. So, you know, I was playing against, uh, you know, internationals. It's different now in rugby league. You know, back in my day, you know, I was playing against All Blacks. I was playing against Kangaroos. Uh, you know, I was playing against England, Welsh internationals. I was playing against people that had done so many things in the game of rugby union, which I hadn't achieved. To play against the, the likes of, of Jim Fallon meant a lot to me. You know, I, I had something to prove. And uh, I had something to prove on that day playing against him. And I say, and Gary Schofield as well. The, the GOAT, or the self-proclaimed GOAT. <laughs> as I like to call him. <laughs> I love Gary, uh, he gets a lot of stick, but you know, he is a great player and uh, you know, he's done great stuff and there was lots of great players on that, uh, that Leeds team. And uh, they, they gave it to us and if anyone who, who was at Wembley that day knows that they threw the kitchen sink at us. Whew. When I uh, think about that try in 94, just like I get emotional because uh, you know, it does mean so much to me. It's like, uh, it's going to define my life now, you know, when I'm uh, not here anymore, you know, that is the one moment that would define my career. You know, there, was, there was this thing among wingers, you know, going the length at Wembley, scoring the length of the field try at Wembley. It wasn't just enough as a winger to score a try at Wembley. You wanted to score a length of the field try at Wembley. You know, if I could dream of scoring a try, that's the try I would dream of scoring. To pick the ball up from dummy half with the whole team in front of you at Wembley, you know, as I say, it doesn't get any better than that for me. I, 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 I'm choking up thinking about it and, you know, and I always think to myself, you know, if, if Neil Harmon was stood just an inch more to the left, then maybe I wouldn't have got outside him. And, uh, you know, that's why I went down to my knees at the end and prayed because I knew it was more than me. You know, all the stars had to align. You know, you can be great. You can have, be in great teams, but everything has to come together on a given day for you to create something brilliant. I wouldn't have a, a clue, you know, what John Dorahe said to us at half time, if, if I'm honest. Um, the people that were responsible for that victory in my eyes, and this is just on my humble opinion, Dean Bell and Sean Edwards took hold of that team at stage through the season. They were the ones who'd been there the longest. You know, what could John Dorahe <laughs> tell them about winning? They'd been under the, <laughs> the lights of low money and, and experienced, you know, so many things, you know, that Wigan team that beat Manly in 87. You know, and that opened my eyes to, you know, what you could possibly achieve in this game. And I thought, I want some of that. You know, they were the guys who had been in the trenches and, you know, those were, those were the guys that I followed. And uh, those were the guys that I listened to. And, uh, you know, thankfully we came out in the second half and, you know, we put performance together. But it was still tough. Leeds, you know, that the, they came back at us. and They scored some tries in the second half. I think even Sko will probably like to remember that. I think he uh, flat-footed me and skipped 
around me and, and, and got in the try in the corner. And you could see the Leeds team were pumped up, man. They were ready to play that day as well. You know, uh, they matched us every step of the way. And, uh, you know, my second try, which does not get much attention, I do believe was better, if not, you know, definitely as good as the try that I, I scored in the first half. If you freeze frame that try early on, I, I remember it now and that Jim Fallon was in between me and Mick Cassidy. So he was close to Mick Cassidy when I was. So I was like, I need to get to this guy. So I don't think I've ever run faster in my life to get to Mick Cassidy, to get on his outside. So to think I've got to go past Jim Fallon to get to Cassidy. And then I've got, I think, a scoey on the inside of him. And I've got um, Jim Fallon. And I just remember that's something that, you know, the things that you learn as a winger, and these, these things that, that you can't be coached. And that is that if you watch that trial, you'll see that from the time I get the ball, I get no closer to Jim, to Jim Fallon or no further away from him. And that's because I just know that, you know, when you, you get the ball in your hand in that time, you don't go for the line. You wait for the line to come for you. You just got to be patient, know that and keep your speed. And I know that he's there and I just know that I just got, don't let him catch me, don't let him catch me. And I see a lot of times in big games, I see wingers get the tries and they burn out because I done all my hard work early, you know, in, 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 like, like in the first try, you do your hard work early, then you just like sprint and drills, you get into that mode of speed and you just stay there you just he has to catch me you know what I mean that's what I say he, I don't have to run fast than Jim Fallon I only have to run as fast as Jim Fallon and as I say the skill it took to score that second try you know when you break it down and you know those things you know and uh, and I managed to score it and it gave me as much satisfaction there, and it was just as important to winning the game after I scored that second try all I had in my mind was hat trick hat trick hat trick and sometimes in life you know you don't get what wouldn't say you deserve or what you're trying for but you know that's why it's always good to aim high and I was trying to get over that day and you know it, it didn't happen and I always blame um, Phil Clark because he threw the most wobbliest of passes out to me and then it's just like I think it hit the floor and I not, ended up knock, knocking on falling over and I'm looking up and I'm seeing Francis Cummins you know have his moment and uh, go in the length to, to, to score that try and, uh, and I, I always remember thinking and I was looking up to him I'm thinking man if that was the winner, they're never going to show my try ever again. <laughs> to uh, win the, the Lance Todd, uh, you know, meant everything to me. Uh, as I say, playing on the wing is a very easy position to play. One of the easy, well, playing rugby is not easy, but if you're going to pick all the positions to play, playing on the wing is probably one of the easiest positions to play, but one of the most difficult positions to play well. You know, in the history of, you know, Lance Todd's, Man of Steel's, Harry Sunderland's, you know, how many wingers have won them? It's more scrum halves, <laughs> centres, forwards, you know, very few wingers have won the Man of Steel, very few wingers, to say, have won Lance Todd's. And so it was a, a great honour to, uh, you know, to win it twice. I think only a few people won it twice. You know, Longy has won it three times, I think, but he shared it with, with uh, Wello one year, I think, so that only counts as half. <laughs> It's special having uh, a statue at Wembley, you know, work, again, like scoring that try, you know, that's why you have to believe, if you don't believe in God, you've got to believe in something divine when you come, you know, onto this planet because you can be the most successful, you, you know, I could have come to this planet and earn 100 million pounds and not have that accolade, you know, it's beyond money, it's beyond what I did to, to be up there, you know, with some great lessons, and obviously the likes of Boston and Murphy as well. Gus Risman, you know, which charts the history and sort of my sort of little part of it is sort of, I feel like a connection with the modern game, you know. It's like you have to be old enough, you know, you can't be young, too young to be on, on a statue. And, uh, you, know, and you know, when I found out that I was going to be on the statue, I started to feel a bit nervous, you know, because it was going to be, um, I found out like, you know, two or three years before it actually came up. And then, you know, it made me start to be healthy because I thought, I want to, I'm getting on a bit now. You know, I look quite young, but I'm like, you know, I'm well past 50. And I was like, I want to be alive to actually see it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, yeah, you know, I, I, I love it. And I, my, my kids love it. And, you know, and, uh, you know, they was like, oh, Dad, can we go up and see the statues some random days and stuff like that? And like, it makes me smile when they say that because it gives me an excuse to go because, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm honoured. You know, Rugby League has given me so much and, and I've been blessed, you know, and I like to feel like I like to repay Rugby League by, you know, doing the best I can uh, within the sport and I'm being an ambassador for the sport and, uh, yeah, you know, going to play Rugby League back in 1987 was the best decision I ever made.